uh, the Salman Rushdie affair uh, was divided into the heroes and the cowards. Uh, so there were those who understood the principles that were at stake, who didn't uh, have very much understanding of what we all see now, which is the, um, you know, the, the, the inexorable rise of fundamentalism. And so they were quite haughty in their understanding of this ridiculous thing, and they, but they were very brave. Uh, so Ian McEwan was very brave, uh, Blake Morrison was very brave, the publishers uh, were very brave, former, former editors were very brave, but they all knew that they could uh, be killed. Uh, because of course the fatwa was not just against Salman, it was against uh, uh, the publishers. So what we did in the, uh, the, our free-floating world that doesn't have reference to anything else is we carried on uh, being there for Salman. So there were any number of literary events at which there would be a mystery guest would turn out to be Salman. So he was very much part of uh, our, our, our literary world continuously. I think we're in, uh, I know we're in a very, very uh, dangerous place now because the, um, the, the rise of um, religious extremism um, is, seems to be unstoppable. And I do feel, um, as a person uh, connected to the network of, uh, of Penn, uh, that, that there's very little understanding in the traditional uh, political institutions and, and the uh, traditional media, the very little understanding of what the real issues are. It's almost as if they're still locked into the tail end of uh, the, the Cold War, 1989 uh, uh, to be precise. They haven't figured out how to um, analyze and unravel the, the, the situation that we have now. And it has been very difficult to explain to the younger generation who are coming um, from an unbounded social media background, and they're trying to um, um, bound that world, world. But we haven't yet understood how to explain to our younger generation how, uh, how dangerous it is to take the, um, uh, the side of the censors. The fatwa against Rushdie, the burning of satanic verses, had a huge impact uh, and reverberated around the world. As an organization run, uh, for black and minority women, South of Black Sisters, we were totally shaken to the core by the level of animosity, hostility that was being displayed to what was in effect a book, a, a writer's imagination, a writer's literary imagination, a creative piece of writing. So we had newly formed uh, Women Against Fundamentalism because we understood that this was not uh, just about um, defending the, the work of a, one particular writer, but it was about something much more bigger than we had imagined, something that had taken us all by surprise which was the way in which religion was being used to clamp down on free speech, freedom of expression, um, and freedom of conscience. We were really concerned by what we were seeing was in effect the warning signs of fundamentalism that was on the rise throughout the world. Forming Women Against Fundamentalism, we decided that our first act had to be to defend Salman Rushdie's right to write, the right to dissent. And the reason we did that was because up until that moment, the debate in the media and in the public was only, was a binary one. It was either liberal literary people who were coming out and defend of Rushdie's right to write, or it was the um, Muslim fundamentalists who claiming to speak on behalf of all Muslims arguing that he had committed blasphemy. What we were concerned about was that there were no progressive voices of activism, of uh, political movements of the left, of feminists, standing up and saying that what was happening to Rushdie was something far more significant than just about the right to be creative. So we decided to 
demonstrate against a large fundamentalist demonstration that had been organized calling for the death of Salman Rushdie and supporting the fatwa and calling for the banning of the book. Um, we knew that it was going to be a large demonstration because um, a large uh, army of of people who had been galvanized in a very emotional way. People who'd never read the book had been galvanized in defense of so-called Islam. And, but even when we arrived at Parliament Square where we decided to wait as a group of black and white women, feminists, we were about 40 women. And when we waited at Parliament Square, we were taken aback by the thousands upon thousands of largely young, angry Muslim men led by clerics, so-called community leaders with transnational fundamentalist links, which was never properly explored by the media, who were leading this uh, defense of the religion. Um, we did not expect the kind of vitriol, the uh, aggressive, violent, reaction that we got. We stood there with our placards and slogans um, which said, fear is your weapon, courage is ours, religious leaders don't speak for us, our traditions struggle not submission, our bodies, our minds, we have the right to choose our own destinies. These were some of our slogans. We stood there in peaceful protest to show the world that there wasn't just a binary battle between the literary establishment and fundamentalists, but there were progressives who were standing up for what was right. Um, and we were attacked. We, our, our banner, they lunged for us to break, uh, to tear our banner. And if it hadn't been for the police, ironically, that formed a cordon around them and us, we probably would have been injured, even fate, fatally injured. The, the ironic thing is that the same time that we were protesting against the fanatics, um, a group of fascists of the far right had also turned up about, I think they were a part of a splinter fascist movement that was also trying to oppose the Muslim demonstration to parade their own kind of fascism and anti-Muslim racism. But when they realized that they couldn't face off uh, the huge army that was before them, they turned to us because we were the easier target. So the irony and the paradox of that moment is that we were both chanting down with fundamentalism and then turning around to the far right and shouting down with racism at one and the same time. For us, that moment has encapsulated and embodied the kind of politics we stand for, which is one that says you have to face many directions at once without prioritizing any struggle against oppression, one form of oppression over another. And that remains our politics now. I think one of the key lessons for us is that we have to really understand and be vigilant to the warning signs. This is not just about some disenfranchised group of people who are deprived, who are struggling for their rights. This is the very opposite. This is about authoritarian movements that want to stamp down on fledgling democratic movements for peace, for tolerance, for rights, for human rights, for universal human rights. This is about clamping down on humanity and progress. So I think people have been slow to understand that warning sign that the right to dissent is the lifeblood of any democracy. And dissenting is so important now than ever when we are faced with worldwide uh, authoritarianism of one kind or another, where journalists, writers, artists, activists, lawyers are being put behind bars or killed for their beliefs, for standing up for what is right, for daring to disagree with the status quo. We seem to have moved and drifted towards the right with our eyes shut. That's what it felt like 30 years ago. 
was that too many people were turning a blind eye or remaining silent for what for what because they didn't want to be accused of being racist or Islamophobic it's made no difference 30 years later we have those accusations now more entrenched in the way in which the state deals with minorities, the state deals with religion, facilitates fundamentalism, the way in which the media deals with these issues, where now fundamentalism is now more entrenched than it was, and we are heading in one direction only if we don't stop. As If we call ourselves the progressive left, we really have to do something about this. For me, I did not appreciate 30 years ago that 30 years later we would be struggling in defense of secularism, in defense of human rights, in defense of the idea of that, that there is such a thing as a shared humanity. 30 years ago I knew that we were dealing with something big but just how big even I or, and my colleagues probably didn't realize. Now more than ever we are going to have to amplify the voices of those civilians. It's not people like us, but it's the civilians around the world who are brave and courageous enough to stand up against fundamentalism, to refuse to underestimate it, to refuse to see this as just a little blip in world politics. This has now, fundamentalism, authoritarianism, the far right, the religious right, has mainstreamed itself into societal structures, into the law, into political spaces, into cultural spaces. And we now have even more of an uphill task than we did 30 years ago. Well, when the Satanic Verses was published, nobody was very interested in questions of religion. Even though the Iranian Revolution and the counter-revolution had taken place 10 years before, it hadn't really percolated into British consciousness. So when we had a meeting and said we want to have this and issued a statement at the end of the meeting, uh, the meeting was on religious fundamentalism, and we, uh, Southall Black Sisters had it with the lab local women's labor party, and we said we want to have this meeting on religious fundamentalism, they said okay, but they didn't really know why, you know, why, why are we talking about religion? You know, it's a very strange thing to talk about. And then we issued this statement in support of Rushdie, and it was like a thunderclap. Um, because people didn't understand it. But you know, at that time, there was a progressive anti-racist movement which was very supportive of us. I want to make this point really clearly. We had support from the anti-racist movement. One of the grand men of um, uh, really black liberation uh, called John LaRose, who ran a book fair called The Third World, I think, Black Radical and Progressive Book Fair. Uh, something like that and it had publishers from all over the world it had a lot of uh, extremely interesting uh, talks and so on he made a statement in support of Rushdie he read South Old Black Sisters statement he really put the protective arm of an older brother in the anti-racist movement around us you know so it's not true that we were completely vilified yes we had flack but there was that presence there which we don't see so visible any longer. There were a number of responses because there were, there were people like the uh, first black MP, Bernie Grant, who said, and you'll see it in the film later, uh, said if, if, if Rushdie wants to criticize Muslims, let him go to Saudi Arabia. And he made a lot of absurd statements. Uh, but there were other people who completely understood the issue. And they were from progressive uh, uh, parties. They were from the far left. They were from uh, the, the uh, Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn spoke here in Conway Hall sitting beside me uh, about, uh, in support of Rushdie. Uh, uh, Tariq Ali, who was um, uh, my producer, you know, he, he ran the channel, uh, Bandung File, the program that the, the films were made for. He was very keen on making anti fundamentalist films. So there were a lot of very clear thinking older left people who were very, very clear about this issue. And yes, there was opposition, but that opposition now, this is the point I want to make, it's much worse now than it was 30 years ago. What we call the regressive left or the postmodernist left wasn't as entrenched then as it was now. You saw the beginnings of it, you saw some of those arguments, but they've got so well developed that even with the mass murders like Charlie Hebdo, people are feeling different. 
or they feel that Charlie Hebdo cartoon has brought it on themselves. And they, you know, they're, they're indifferent to the attacks on Jews and the supermarket attack. They're indifferent to the fact that there's very clear armed violence aimed at specific groups of people, which include atheists, which include writers and cartoonists, which include Jews, uh, which include all religious minorities. I mean, they're very, very specific groups of people being attacked in very organized ways. And yet it's always seen as, you know, just some oppressed man who got a little bit, you know, too oppressed and suddenly, you know, woke up and attacked people. It's not spontaneous like that. Uh, I mean, the, the ideology is prime to get people to make spontaneous attacks. And that, it wasn't happening at that level at that time. What we were mostly dealing with was racism of the wider community and the sexism also of the wider community and within our own community. So we had two or three fights on our hands and the religious fundamentalism issue was actually added onto that. At that time, the community leaders we were fighting were secular. They were patriarchal, but they were secular and we were fighting them. But now, many of the community leaders that the government favors are actually fundamentalists. The dissenting movements have grown. Uh, the ex-Muslim movement, obviously, that's a huge worldwide movement. There's an understanding of some of these issues. Women's coalitions have grown over this period. I mean, we were already part of, I was part of uh, the Women Living Under Muslim Laws Coalition, which was all across the world. So Pakistani women were opposing Islamicization in Pakistan. You'll see in the film the Iranian women speaking about what happened in Iran, saying, don't make the mistake of thinking that hijab is liberation. We were saying it at eight and nine. So those understandings were there, and certainly the people who hold to that view the, the networks have grown stronger. Um, so in some ways the, the, the resistance and the understanding is stronger, but the opposition from the liberals is also stronger. The lesson is you must never apologize for blaspheming. Never apologize. Carry on doing what you need to do. If people can't live with blasphemy, it means that they're part of a violent political movement. It's not just about their oppression. Well, clearly, uh, when uh, the Satanic versus uh, Fatwa happened against Salman Rushdie, uh, it was an indication of what uh, was going to come in the world. And we're seeing very clearly now that 30 years on, there are many blasphemy laws that didn't exist 30 years ago. And also, it's become very difficult to blaspheme, uh, even in countries that are secular, and where no blasphemy laws exist. Uh, one of the things that Salman Rushdie says is that, uh, you know, what scares uh, those in power of writers is that they're not promoting the official narrative, and that scares them because that's the narrative that powers in, that those in power want to be sure are imposed. And so, in a sense, that's what blasphemy is, isn't it? Going against the official narrative and uh, dissenting in a way that brings down the walls and challenges power in a way that is very difficult to do. And that's the importance of Salman Rushdie's work, why the satanic verses need to be defended, why Charlie Hebdo needs to be defended, but also why so many of those who are on apostasy and blasphemy sentences in Iran, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, across the world, really need to be defended, because defending them is defending fundamental freedom of expression, which is everyone's right, religious and non-religious.